Let's pray. We bow our knees before the Father from whom all fatherhood is named in heaven and on earth. I pray that all the fathers who hear my voice would feel a sense of wonder that they hold an office defined by God, stemming from God. And that everyone who's lost a father or never knew a father would know that fatherhood is in God. So God, I ask that you would come and love your children now and that you would grant us understanding and courage and compassion and meekness and boldness and saving, sanctifying, cleansing power. In Jesus' name, amen. This message is built around eight points that are intended to give a biblical vision for marriage as it relates in particular to homosexuality and the proposed marriage amendment in Minnesota. I ask that that text in Hebrews 13 be read, not because I'm going to do an exposition of it, but because of that one phrase, let marriage be held in honor. And I would like the upshot of this effort to open the scriptures concerning marriage and homosexuality to do that. I would like us to honor marriage more because of what we have thought about together. So I have eight points, and I'll just go through them one at a time, and you pray that I would speak them in the, in the truth of Scripture and in the tone of Scripture, and, and then when we're done and we realize how incomplete everything is, I pray that more can be said and written later. Number one, marriage is created and defined by God in the scriptures as the sexual and covenantal union of a man and a woman in lifelong allegiance to each other as husband and wife with a view to displaying Christ's covenant relationship to his blood-bought church. And perhaps I should say that I've crafted each one of these very carefully, and it'll just go right by you, and you'll not be able to write them down. And if you wanted to think about them, this is just going to go up on the internet by Tuesday with the very words. So just relax and, and do the mental work here. Don't, don't worry about this. You can, you can check it all out later. Just try to, try to stay with me in your mind and your, and your heart. So let me point to four passages of Scripture from which I got that definition of marriage. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So one of the most profound things that's ever been said is that God created man in his image, male and female, both in his image. Then God himself linked that with marriage in Genesis 2, 23 and 24, which goes like this. When the woman is created from his side, man exclaims, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In other words, God created this amazing being called human or man, male and female. He created us that way so that there could be a one flesh 
sexual union and covenantal cleaving with a view to multiplying the human race and displaying God's covenant love for his people. Then, thirdly, Jesus remarkably puts those two texts together. So you don't have to lean on me to do that. Jesus took the created order of male and female, and then he put it together with the marriage institution, and he did so in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, and it goes like this. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's a quotation of Genesis 1:27 and said, now he quotes Genesis 2.24, therefore, linking creation and marriage, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in our cultural situation, the words let no man separate what God in creating male and female put together has a greater significance than any of us thought it ever would. Fourth text, Ephesians 5, 24 to 32, what Paul adds to this is that he goes right to that same text, Genesis 2, 24, in the context of marriage, and he describes the mystery that it always has been and now is being brought to light. Let me read a few of these verses. This is verse 24 of Ephesians 5. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives you should submit in everything to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now jumping to verse 31, where he quotes Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, from the beginning, there has been a mysterious and profound meaning to marriage. And Paul is now opening the mystery. And it's this, God made man, male and female, with distinctive feminine and masculine natures and distinctive roles going with those natures so that in marriage, as husband and wife, they display Christ and his church. Which means that the basic roles of husband and wife are not interchangeable, and the husband displays the sacrificial love of Christ for headship, and the wife displays submission for Christ's body, living out this miraculous parable and drama that was there from the beginning, now called a mystery, being unfolded. The mystery of marriage is that God had this double, this double display. Husbands display the covenant love of Christ and wives display the covenant love of the church. He had this, this mystery in mind from the beginning. And therefore, the profoundest reality in the universe underlies marriage as a covenantal union between a man and his masculine nature and a woman and her feminine nature displaying different things. End of point number one. Number two, there is no such thing as so-called same-sex marriage, and it would be wise not to call it that. That's point number two. Now, the point here is not simply that um, so-called same-sex marriage shouldn't exist. The point is it doesn't and it can't. 
those who believe that God has spoken to us truthfully in the Bible should not concede that the committed lifelong partnership and sexual relations of two men or two women is marriage. It is not marriage, no matter what anyone on the planet says. God has created and defined marriage. And what he has joined together in that creation and that definition cannot be separated and still be called marriage in God's eyes. Point number three. Same-sex desires and same-sex orientation are part of our broken and disordered sexuality owing to God's subjection of the created order to futility because of man's sin. In Genesis 2, we read about the catastrophic moment when the first man and the first woman rebelled against God. And the effects on them and on the world are unfolded for us in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Genesis and then illustrated in the sin-soaked and death-ridden remainder of the Old Testament, indeed, all of history. The Apostle Paul gives the key interpretation of what happened there and its effect on us. Here's his key word from Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. The creation was subjected to futility. This is God's response to human rebellion. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So this is God who did this. The devil didn't subject it in hope. God cursed creation. We read that in Genesis 3. He subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And then, maybe one of the most important verses of the Bible from my understanding of, of almost everything I deal with in the brokenness of my life, my marriage, my children, this church, this world. Romans 8.23 goes like this. And, and the point of Romans 8.23 is that Paul is looking at the Romans in the face, as it were, who, who are about to say back to him, oh yes, the curse fell upon the world and the whole creation was subjected, but we've been redeemed. And here's his response to that. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's an important verse. And I'm arguing that same-sex desires and same-sex orientation are in that category of groaning waiting for the redemption of our bodies, which means they're in the, the same broad category with all kinds of disordered bodies and minds and emotions. If we tried to make a list, if we tried to make a list of all the kinds of emotional and mental and physical brokenness in the human family, the list would be unending. And all of us are broken. No exceptions. Everybody is disordered. We are disordered in different ways. All of you, without exception, all of you are bent 
toward desiring things you ought not to desire. All of you. And I could document mine. Desires. We haven't gotten to behavior yet. We all have disorder in our emotions and disorder in our minds and disorder in our bodies. And we groan. We groan because of the damage we do. Waiting, waiting for our final, full, complete adoption, the redemption of our whole bodies, brains, emotions, will. This calls for very, very careful distinctions to be made. Lest you hurt people or hurt yourself unnecessarily. All disorders, all brokenness is rooted in sin. Original sin and our sinful nature. All of it. But to be caused by a sinful nature and rooted in sin doesn't make a disorder equal to sinning. Let me say it a little differently because our language here just has to be so careful. It is not wrong, but I think proper to say All of our disordered desires that are going after things we shouldn't go after are sinful desires. Sinful meaning they're rooted in sin and they're contaminated and disordered. They're bent. Hold that. And let's go to number four. Therefore, same-sex intercourse not same-sex desire is condemned in Scripture as threatening eternal destruction. I wonder if you can handle that. A sinful desire because rooted in a sinful nature and disordered by that nature But when the Bible comes to warning us with what will take us to hell, it focuses on same-sex intercourse. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Paul says to the Corinthians, Do you not know... This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. So evidently some in the church are being, starting to be deceived that they could just go right back into what they had left. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral. Now watch this list, okay? It's an important list because of its breadth and its point. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, I'll come back to that, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a very serious warning. It has a huge effect on the way we talk about this and the way we orient ourselves on this with people. Now, the words in verse 9, at the end of verse 9, men who practice homosexuality. I don't know what your version might say. That's the ESV. Those words translate two Greek words. And those true Greek words very probably refer to the passive and the active male in homosexual intercourse. Just to do my homework again... I went to Robert Gagnon's book, 
virtually all scholars I know of say this is the most authoritative biblical analysis of the data on homosexuality that there is. Robert Gagnon, and the title of the book is The Bible and Homosexual Practice. And I read 30 pages about that phrase, and I think he's right. Namely, that this is a good translation of those two words. Men passively or aggressively who are engaging in some kind of homosexual intercourse. So the focus here is not on the desire that is prompting that, but rather on the practice flowing from the desire. And just as important is to notice this. It's not singled out, it's in a list, isn't it? A very familiar list a list from which none of you is innocent, not one. I thought a lot before I said that. I looked at this list carefully. Therefore, nobody's going into the kingdom of heaven if they give themselves away to that behavior or to that desire. Abandoning yourself to a desire like greed is as bad as abandoning yourself to stealing. Number five, therefore, it would contradict love and contradict the gospel of Jesus to approve homosexual practice, whether by silence or by endorsing so-called same-sex marriage, or by affirming the Christian ordination of practicing homosexuals in the Christian church. We must not be intimidated here. The world is going to say the opposite of what is true here. So you need to be ready for this if you haven't experienced it already. They're going to say that warning people who practice homosexual intercourse, that they are subject to final and everlasting judgment is hateful. That's what they're going to say. It is not hateful. Hate does not want people to be saved. does not want people to join the family. Hate wants to destroy, and sin does destroy. If homosexual practice and greed and idolatry and reviling and drunkenness lead to exclusion from the kingdom of God, then love warns Love pleads. Love comes alongside and does everything it can to see that this person have life forever. That's what love does. Number six. The good news of Jesus is that God saves heterosexual sinners and homosexual sinners who trust Jesus. By counting them righteous because of Christ, by helping them through His Spirit to live lives pleasing to Him in their disordered brokenness. Now we go to verse 11, the most important verse I will read in this message. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, after warning the Corinthians not to fall back into lives of sinful practice, lest they perish, he says this, and the implications are huge for us, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is the heart of biblical Christianity. Such were some of you. There were Christians in the church at Corinth that everybody knew had been fornicators. Everybody knew they were adulterers, and everybody knew they had been practicing homosexuals. They knew it. Paul knew it. And he's not even there. They were not driven away. They were folded in. And the way they were folded in, it says, is they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they heard the gospel. They turned to the Lord Jesus and turned away from those practices and held on to Jesus and were by faith united to Jesus. And God looked upon them and said, not guilty, innocent, righteous in my son, justified. And then it says, they were washed. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Not only were they clothed with a righteousness that is imputed to them because of Christ, their shame and their sin is washed away. As far as the east is from the west, buried at the bottom, forgotten as it were by an infinite God, And then third, it says they were sanctified, which means by the Holy Spirit, they were set apart for God. You're mine. You're sanctified. You're consecrated. You're not that anymore. You're mine, and I'm pouring my Holy Spirit into you. And when I pour him into you, I'm going to swallow up your disordered desires I'm saying this carefully. Listen. I'm going to swallow up your disordered desires in something greater and more beautiful and more desirable so that you can walk in a way that pleases me in your brokenness. We've met them, right? You know them. Life that seemed to be reduced to eroticism has now been swallowed up in something so much more. This hasn't been healed totally. We know men who've married. It hasn't totally gone away. They deal with it. Others deal with other things. The relationship is unique. It's different. But the, the, the life is swallowed up. Love is so much more. Relationships are so much more. The erotic is now a piece of life. It isn't the consuming all of life. That's sanctification. That's the Holy Spirit just enlarging and enlarging and enlarging until there are so many fields and mountains and plains and glorious flowers and meadows in life. You don't have to stay there in that compost pile of eroticism all the time, no matter which orientation it has. He does that. The heart of Christianity is that God saves sinners through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The best news in all the world is that Jesus Christ died and rose again, that the most bizarre sexual predator, pick your one in the news right now, the best news in all the world 
is that Jesus Christ died so that the most bizarre sexual predator, whether homosexual or heterosexual, can be rescued from his path of destruction, washed, justified, sanctified, and given a place in God's all-satisfying presence forever. That's the heart of Christianity. Point number seven, deciding what actions will be made legal or illegal through civil law is a moral activity aiming at the public good and informed by the worldview of each participant. Deciding what actions will be made legal or illegal through civil law is a moral activity. Minnesota citizens are being asked this November to vote yes or no on this question. This is what you will read on your ballot. Shall the Minnesota Constitution be amended to provide that only a union of one man and one woman shall be valid or recognized as a marriage in Minnesota. And a blank vote is a no vote. Now if passed, Section 13 will be added to Article 13 of the State Constitution, which will read this. Only a union of one man and one woman shall be valid or recognized as a marriage in Minnesota. So the question I'm asking under point seven is how should Christian citizens decide which of their views they should seek to put into law? Which moral conviction should Christians seek to pass as legal requirements in society? Christians believe in the immorality of covetousness and the immorality of stealing. But we seek to pass laws against stealing, not covetousness. Why? That's not an easy question to answer. One of the principles at work here seems to be that the line connecting coveting with damage to the public good is not clear enough. No doubt there is a line. No doubt there is a connection that God sees perfectly clearly, and if everybody stopped being covetous, society would be a lot better. No doubt. But it's very hard to draw that line. And therefore, it seems that that's one of the principles that keeps us from legislating things like covetousness. It's not clear enough how laws and penalties could be enacted to manage its reality and its effects. This is why we must leave hundreds of immoral acts for Jesus to sort out when he comes back and must not try to play God with our laws. Jesus can see every heart perfectly and everyone will be rewarded according to his heart as well as his actions because Jesus can see and we can't. Laws exist to preserve and enhance the public good. Everybody would agree with that. Which means, and here it gets controversial, all laws are based on some conception of what the public good is. What's good? Which means that all legislation and all voting is a moral activity. It is based on choices about what is good for the public. Forming choices about what is good is a moral activity. 
And those choices are always informed by a worldview, always. Religious or irreligious, what you think is good for people is informed by a conception of reality, a worldview. And in that worldview, whether conscious or unconscious, there are views of ultimate reality that determine what you think is good for people. Which means all legislation is the legislation of morality, without exception. I got two tickets in the mail. Not driving tickets. My branches are over the sidewalk. I'm going to be fined in 12 days. My branches are over the sidewalk of my hedge. So I clipped them. <laughs> I, I obey the law. Then I got another one. I forgot to put the clippings in a compostable bag. <laughs> and now, by Tuesday, I have to empty the big black sturdy bag into a wimpy little green bag. <laughs> now, what's the point of that little interlude? The, the point is, isn't it amazing that there's a cultural consensus about the good that, it, that puts the power of jail and fines into the hands of the police because of my branches? My branches are too long. I, I personally think that's probably a good law. I don't like messy neighborhoods. I'd like to take some of the other houses in my neighborhood and say, why don't you send in some letters? <laughs> that's the way laws are. We have decided, somebody decided, and they're deciding won the day you won't have any branches sticking over the sidewalk in this city. You, you're going to put all your, all your clippings now in, in bags that disappear in the ground instead of sticking there for a thousand years. That's probably a good idea. But think of the power in that. Think of the control in that. Think of the legislation of a morality of environment in that. Just, just, just relax about this, okay? All laws legislate morality. All of them. It's really important. Someone's view of what is good, what is moral, wins the minds of the majority and carries the day. And the question is, which actions hurt the common good, enhance the common good so much that they should be prohibited by law or required by law? And so what I'm going to do here is give you four suggestions. And here I feel like I'm pushing the upper limit of my pay grade. Um, m my happy conviction is that pastors ought not to be experts in lots of things. And I'm certainly not an expert in civil law and how economics work and how politics work. I just don't know much. Uh, I should read my Bible and try to understand what God said and then say as much as I know. And I'm counting on a lot of lay people to do a lot of hard work for me. Okay, that's the conception I have. If you, if you think I'm the expert on everything, sorry. It's kind of late in my ministry for you to be corrected about that. <laughs> All right. This is the best I can do to give you some guidance on trying to decide what kinds of laws, what kinds of moral convictions should be put in the Constitution, all right? Number one, a constitutional amendment should address a matter of very significant consequence. Now, to give you an idea of what has been regarded as worthy of inclusion in the state Constitution, Section 12 of Section 13, of, of Article 13, so these, these, this is a place where you kind of stack up miscellaneous things in the Constitution. So in 1998, we Minnesotans passed an amendment to the Constitution. I'll read it to you. This is the one that comes just before the empty space 
where the other one would be put if it passed. And here's what it says. Hunting and fishing and the taking of game and fish are a valued part of our heritage that shall be forever preserved for the people and shall be managed by law and regulation for the public good. That's Section 12, Article 13 of the Minnesota Constitution. So, I would suggest that as you discern the relative importance of what should be in the Constitution, you could start there. <laughs> Number two, the recognition of so-called same-sex marriage would be a clear social statement that motherhood or fatherhood or both are negligible for the public good in raising children. Two men adopting children cannot provide motherhood. And two women adopting children cannot provide fatherhood. But God ordained from the beginning that children grow up with a mother and a father and said to those children, honor your father and your mother. And everybody knows tragedies in life often, way often than we wish, make that impossible. But taking action to make the tragedy normal might be worth prohibiting by law. Number three, marriage is the most fundamental institution among humans. Its origin is in the mind of God, and its beginning was in the beginning of creation of humankind. Its connections with all other parts of society are innumerable. Pretending that it can exist between people of the same sex will send ripple effects of dysfunction and destruction in every direction, most of which are now unforeseen. And many of those that are foreseen are tragic, especially for children who will then produce a society we cannot imagine. Number four, before now, that is before the last 30 years or so, as far as we know, no society in the history of the world has ever defined marriage as between people of the same sex, none. It is a mind-numbing innovation with no precedent to guide us except the knowledge that unrighteousness destroys nations and the celebration of it hastens the destruction. Finally, point number eight. Don't press the organization of the church or her pastors into political activism. Pray that the church and her ministers would feed the flock with the word of God, centered on the gospel of Christ crucified and risen. Expect from your shepherds, not that they would rally you behind political candidates or legislative initiatives, but that they would point you over and over and over to God and to his word and to the cross. Now please try to understand this concluding point. When I warn you against politicizing me or politicizing the institution called Bethlehem or the church in general, I do so not to diminish the church's power but to increase it. 
The impact of the church for the glory of Christ and for the good of the world does not increase when she shifts her focus from worship of God, winning of souls, maturing and nurturing of faith, and raising up a new generation. It doesn't. It feels in the moment like it does. <laughs> look how many people showed up for the rally. Or look how many signatures in that church they got. Or look how that committee is functioning. Or it feels powerful. Give it a generation. And little by little, that vaunted power bleeds away the very nature of the church and its power. If the whole counsel of God is preached with power, week in and week out, Christians who are citizens of heaven and citizens of the democratic order will be energized as they ought to speak and act for the common good. It's your job, not mine. Don't look to me to wave the flag for your vote or wave the flag for your candidate. I may not like him or it because of what God says. Let me read you from this week's World Magazine, the editorial by Marvin Olasky. Many of you are familiar with World. World is a very political magazine, and it ought to be. I just love Marvin Olasky and the team at World. Glad they're doing what they're doing. And here's what he said in an article pleading with churches not to be politicized. Wise pastors prompt Christians to form associations outside the church and leave the church to its central task from which so many blessings flow. That pattern in the 18th and 19th centuries worked exceptionally well. New England pastors in colonial times preached and taught what the Bible said about liberty and the sons of liberty, not a subset of any particular church, eventually sponsored a tea party in Boston Harbor. Pastors through America during those centuries, preached about biblical poverty fighting. And in the city, the city of New York, Christians formed organizations such as the Association for the Improving of the Condition of the Poor. End quote. You get the idea. My job is to feed the saints with such meals that they go out strengthened and robust and, and able to do the study and do the, the courage and do the action needed as salt and light in this world. And that will go away if you insist on the church and the ministry being the political leaders. It will. And we could point to many where it has. Now, I'm done. Let me give it a postscript here. There's so much more to say. So much more to say. So what I would like to do is plan to write a, a few blogs this week on some things. And the one I have in mind, the thing that I haven't addressed at all, except by implication, is relationships that you have with people with same-sex attraction. Relationships. In your families, at your work, in your extended family, um, and, you, and navigating these relationships is really a challenge. And I would like to provide some help there as well, and th there isn't time here. So uh, track those down if, if God gives me grace. I have, I have some things that, that I would like to say that just might be helpful. So concluding word. Remember, you who trust Jesus, and, and I hope all of you will, because that's the center of this message. Remember, you who trust Jesus, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Be amazed that you are saved and offer it 
to everybody. Let's pray. Lord, you know my inadequacies on many levels and so have mercy that this will be heard as you want it heard. And anything I've said that's not true or helpful would be canceled out. And what I have said that is true and according to your word would be confirmed in people's lives. And so make us a church with backbone in a failing culture and make us a church with profound compassion and patience. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.